Hi everyone, Ryan here from Three Idiots. Welcome to our podcast. Today we're going to talk about monster fish. Woo! One of my favourite subjects, monster fish. <laughs> right up there with plecos, mm. plants, and other cool stuff like that. Exciting things. Um, we deliberately haven't actually defined what we all call it, a monster fish yet, so it'll be interesting. We'll probably all just disagree on that the whole time and um, go around in circles about whether a pearl grammy is a monster fish or not. So <laughs> let's get started with the inbred cam from Nelson. Me? Well, there you me. go. Well, there you go. Tell us, tell us about your experience with monster grammies. There so, is actually a monster grammy, actually. So there we yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> so for the record, I'm from Wellington and I'm not inbred. Just to set the record straight. Uh, so I think my definition of uh, a monster fish is, for the best part, one that gets quite large, obviously. Um, eight, nine inches sort of scenario or bigger. And they tend to have a bit of a attitude or an aggression issue with them. I don't think that's the... That's on all cases, things like... Black sharks get absolutely ginormous, um, but they're not particularly super duper aggressive. But they would definitely be considered a, a monster fish. Um, but things like frontosa, which do get quite large and are probably pushing into that larger, close to monster fish size, but they're not super aggressive, wouldn't go into that category if that makes sense. Um, so I guess the classics what we get here: silver arowanas, Texas. Jack Dempsey, Jags, Oscars, um, they'd all be in there. I'd probably put your standard common gold spot and red spot plecos into that scenario, despite them not being aggressive, but they are. They do get ridiculously big. Um, pink garamis, red tail garamis, um, that sort of thing would fall into that, that category as well. Um, although silver sharks get large, I don't really put them into that quite type situation. Um, but like the pink tail can't even say the word, the large pigtail things that do get quite big would, would definitely go in there, and tinfoil barbs, not aggressive. Chelsea, but yes. Yeah, that's one, Chelsea, yes. And then, like, the, um, oh, I've lost my, my thought train there. You're talking about bar bad. tinfoil barbs. Tinfoil barbs, yeah. Get huge, but not aggressive, but would, would still be in that kind of category, so there's a bit of, bit of wiggle room in the get big and aggressive sort of scenario. How do you, I think how it's do interesting you define aggressive? That, that you define, yeah, monster fish by aggression. I just think that that's what would, when people think monster fish, they think big and angry fish. But when you say aggressive, fish. do you mean like to fight a lot or do you mean just eat little stuff? Because uh, I would argue... <laughs> I would silver argue are they particularly some, aggressive, are they? Yeah, they're placid uh, as, Oscars are placid as... Um, I don't think that's true. We both know that's not true. It is. They like to mean? fight. They they like to fight. They like to to get their anger on. In my experience, Oscars would much rather keep out the way. But if something does start something, then they will get involved. But they'd much rather just do their own thing and dig a hole. Yeah, and aggressive compared to. We're going to throw back to a guppy here. I know all fish can be aggressive in their own thing, <laughs> but like. There's a totally difference in the aggression between a guppy and a and an Oscar, for example. I don't know if there's I a hate... difference in aggression. I think there's a difference in like physical capabilities. Like a guppy can't oh, really yeah. do that much damage, but yeah, an Oscar of... probably could if it tried. Yeah, yeah. I, so... I think the definition of monster fish are a bigger fish, and they they like to be aggressive. Or are more. That's aggressive. a very interesting point that I don't know if I can get behind, but. I sort of, I guess I understand where you're coming from. So yeah, yeah it's interesting. Not, I think but... also, I think also, like um, Cam's points out, that Oscars, he thinks Oscars are really aggressive, but and to some degree, I'd agree with him. But I also think it's probably what we're all going to touch on or, or talk about is um, an Oscar in a, a fully grown Oscar in like a four foot tank, a small tank, will probably just kill everything because he doesn't have enough space so he's not going to be very comfortable he's going to have probably some anxiety and, and shit like that if fish get anxiety and we can't give them any prozac so 
he's gonna um he's probably gonna bash everyone because he's not very happy and and that that tank probably represents all the space that he actually needs to to just sort of chill and as Cam says, dig his holes and sulk and do what everyone else does, you know. So it is all environmental as well, I believe. Mm, yeah, especially with that mate. I definitely agree with that, hundred um, percent. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, if no, we, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I mean, if we had a tank the size of our lounge, we can keep anything, you know, and it'd probably get along because there's enough space for everything. But you know. I think looking at the fish that we have available, Central American and South American cichlids would be majority of what you'd consider monster fish from basically what we can get here, give or take. We haven't had that um, definition yet. And, and a majority of them are um, fairly aggressive when, when it comes to the bigger ones. Or at what least can hold, can hold their what, own quite significantly well. What about a clown loach? I don't really consider them monster fish. Oh, yeah, yeah. No okay. frontosa. You don't consider frontosa a monster fish? No. Oh. No, I don't. Interesting. Well, I do, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, what else do you consider a monster fish then, Ryan? I'd go through. I wouldn't probably wouldn't do clown loaches either. I mean, they do get 30 centimetres, but they take, you know, a lifetime to get there. So, yeah, if you had 12 adults, yeah, they'd probably be monster fish. But in reality... Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of my own definition, really. I think in anything, to me, I'm thinking anything that needs to be in something, a tank that's sort of bigger than about six foot, like 1.8 metre, is probably where I'd sort of go from, yeah, that's a, a normal fish to a monster fish, you know. So you're keeping mm -hmm. it big. I wouldn't have anything to do with aggression, really. I think that, I don't think it has anything to do with how big the fish gets and how big the tank needs to be. But, yeah, it's an interesting one. I that's why we don't define these things before we do these podcasts, so we end up with Arguing a bit of discussion. A bit of discussion. We don't even have to agree, so it doesn't really matter, does it? Yeah. What about you, Cam? Exactly. I mean, monster fish aren't really my thing. I mean, I've had a, a reasonable amount to do with them over the, over the many years of playing with fish, but I haven't kept a lot. So Cam's yeah. probably kept, you know, non-inbred Cam's probably kept more than... Um, <laughs> More than I have, so more than both of us have, probably. So, I'd say for, for me, it. I'd say, I'd say the general kind of well, there's like two things I want to say. So, number one, because like I know we do have some overseas listeners, we don't really have monster fish, you know, like an arowana is like a small monster fish, really, oh, yeah. like on the scale of things, and that's probably up there with like the biggest thing we get. So, I think it's, you know, we don't. Yeah, there's, there's like gars and like the big like ripsaw cats and like arapaimas and stuff. We don't get anything yeah. like that size. So on the New Zealand scale of things, I'd say for me, I think anything that requires a six foot or larger tank as well. Um, but I'm going to say anything. So like I would consider a clown loach a monster fish. I'd consider, I'd consider a common goldfish like a comet goldfish to be a monster fish in the scale of monster fish for new zealand um just because you know they're going to get big move a lot all this kind of thing um and then we've got like you know your your arowanas your giant karamis um datnoids flagtail protolotus all this kind of stuff um stuff that gets large um so yeah, that's kind of what I'd suggest. Um, I forgot about that actually. Yeah, they get big, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They're another one. Paku. Retail Paku, if you can find them. I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. think you should be looking out there looking for them. I think they should be importing them because I did. Not many people can have them, but I think I don't. From what I understand, I don't think they um, are imported anymore. But there's still some people. I don't know. I, I never really heard that much about it, but I did read a while ago um, that there was some guy. What's happened just then? Oh, you hello. Just came just my, vanished. My, my computer yeah. just turned off and then came back on again. Oh, that was weird. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Some you can see technical the horse, issues the horse, going on. 
horse that, tri- that powers the powers a shop fell off the wheel. So you had to go yeah, back out pretty much. And give, it, give it some oats and get it turning around again to, to get the power going. I don't I don't know what's recorded. It's we're not recording at the moment. Oh, it, says, it, says oh. it says we're still You're recording. Still okay, so recorded through the whole thing. Yeah. It's just everything went blank on me. I don't know what's gonna happen through this, so we'll have a look afterwards. It's typical for someone good. from Nelson, they go they go blank regularly. Oh, from Wellington. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, yeah, me and Ryan were still talking, so I'll just pick up what I was saying. Um, I believe, so from my understanding, I don't think that Black Parker's um, imported anymore, but I did read a while ago that there was a guy up north who was breeding them as, like, food fish. Um, I didn't, in, like, an aquaponic setup. Um, I don't know, you know, what the truth behind it or, or anything is um, in that space, but I think it's, uh, you know, that's kind of like the best application for a fish like that, um, you know, in big ponds and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, um, I'd say that's kind of my a bit controversial definition. Um, Do you want to just quickly and, and, summarise for Cam? Oh, yeah. So it was so like... I heard, um, I heard silver arowana and then everything disappeared. Oh, yeah. Well, we don't really get monster fish in New Zealand. Um, So flatly, just anything requiring a six-foot tank or larger, and that includes stuff like goldfish and clown loaches and that kind of thing. Um, So, yeah, in terms of New Zealand. But, yeah. And I guess it's also, in my opinion, it's also a good thing we get get less in New Zealand because... um, Mm. I think with a smaller hobby here and with more expensive costs and for whatever reason, we tend to get a lot less people that are doing insane monster setups like they do overseas, you know, people converting their entire basement into a fish tank or, um, and also overseas, a lot of them do outdoor ponds and stuff for them because the climate's a lot is, is different, you know? Yeah, I was going to say so that think, climate doesn't really allow that. I personally think we probably already import breed and sell too many of these fish already that can't be housed um, from an ethical agree. point of view. Um, when I see photos of two or three hundred black arowana getting imported, I just think, oh, you know. Where are they going? Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. If, I'm not arrogant enough to say that I know every single fish keeper in the country, you know. But in the last 25 years, I've, I've met quite a few and I've seen quite a few things, you know. So I would suspect yeah. that a lot of them don't go to the, to the right homes. I'd say with that, I'd say like, I think there is like, if you're looking on Facebook and that, there is, I'm going to say more um, suitable monster fish aquariums around um, or, you know, setups around than you'd first think. But I definitely agree. Like something like a silver arowana, I'd say maybe at the most five percent of the ones that sold goes to a suitable home, um, or even like a defensible home. Like it's the same with like any fish. It's like the ideal setup's gonna. You ask a hundred people, you'll get a hundred uh, responses. But if it's, I think if it's more or less alright, like. You know, you can understand an argument that it's fine. That's one thing. But I'd say probably only 5% go to even that sort of setup. Um, You know, people doing, like, you know, for a silver arowana, really you want a pond or a very large tank. Um, The hard part is, the hard part is in New Zealand is you can't actually easily buy the tank that you need to house a silver arowana. Like, you look at all Mm -hmm. of the, off the shelf tanks and yeah well, most of them are like the tank behind me or my display tank that are usually a lot taller than they are longer which is pointless for a silver arowana and most of them aren't wide enough you know like you yeah can, most of the commercial tanks are only five or six hundred front to back yeah. you know like aqua, really aquas which is which are 1.8 meter longs but they're only 500 what front to back you know so they're quite a small mm. footprint and they're really all commercially what you available. for those is like re- when you're talking about monster fish really what you need like what is needed is like either you build something yourself like uh people convert like the um you know preformed swimming pools or whatever um either that or you've got to spend a lot to get one 
like a big tank custom made. Um, there is people around who will do it, but yeah, it's not like going to be cheap, you know. Mark Mark will build you a nice plywood tank down in Tauranga. He builds beautiful yeah. tanks, you know, and you can build yeah. a pond like Nelly, you know. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it takes a lot of commitment, I guess, is the thing. Yeah, you know? it's like a lot of money, space to put it, running costs. You got to pretty much DIY your filters and everything. Um, it's a lot involved, but you know there is plenty of people who will do it, and it is very doable. It's just like money and time and stress yeah, and all just, this kind of thing. It's just commitment as well, eh? And um, and you can have heartbreak as well on a on a much larger scale. You're digging a lot bigger holes to to bury the fish if something goes wrong. So, mm. and um, and they do have, I mean, arguably they have more personality than other, you know, than, than smaller fish. Where I don't they, think it's arguable. I think they definitely do. Like, there's a way more, like. They got a lot more going on than a tetra does. No offense to tetras, but is, you know, is that because it's more definable because you can pinpoint each fish, or because they're bigger? So in theory, they've got a bigger brain. Uh, I don't know the science behind it, but like, there's a lot more like interaction. Like, for example, with my arowana, I can like play with her and stuff. Whereas, like, even for something like cool, like, well, not cool, but like. You know, like a, I don't know, electric blue hat, for example, is a bit bigger, but and there's like behaviors going on, but there's not that like interaction level really. Um, like they'll recognize the food container, and that's about it. Whereas like the arowana like follows me around and like will play with me and like let her patter and all this kind of thing. Um, hmm. So yeah, it, it's a little bit different, I think. I mean, I remember when Penny was sick that time, and you were. Uh... Like really, really stressed and really, like really upset for him. Yeah. And, um, and you that spent was not a good a, time. Quite a bit of time and quite a bit of money, um, getting those X-rays and getting all that real specialist care for her to actually get her back to health. Yeah. Like, um, like we care, we all care about our fish, but if it was a um, was a neon tetra, you probably wouldn't have um, gone to those lengths to, you yeah. know, or, or even noticed it was that more, sick, you know. What is like it? What's that? Is that a money investment thing? Like a neon tetra is four bucks, an Asian arowana is three, four, five thousand dollars, whatever it costs. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not even good. I'm not even saying we don't provide the best home or care for our fish, right? But um, no, no, no. But um, but um, it is because that fish was bigger, more interactive, and stuff. He was able to pick up on it sooner. Um, also, probably the practicalities of actually X-raying a fish and, and um getting it examined and doing blood tests and things like that are probably a lot more practical on a bigger fish, you know. I think it's more like, I think it's more also like the emotional bond. Like we talk mm. about, um, you know, with something like, a, you know, like a neon tetra, for example, is like not necessarily like everyone, but a lot of people uh, kind of use it as like a consumable. Um, it's like not really like a, mm. oh yeah, disposable is the word, like, not really that big. It's like a tiny little fish. Um, but whereas you you see like the bigger fish, not necessarily like arowana size even, but like people get very attached to like, you know, more medium sized fish like a pearl gourami, Um, Just because it's a bit more like you're able to form that emotional bond easier than you are to like something super tiny like a neon. Um, like I, I, I think it pretty much is just like a, like a size – um, scale, like a sliding scale, I guess. Um, I think a lot of monster fish keepers form, like I said, very much form bonds with their fish and they become more more like a pet than a pet. Uh, more like a pet than yeah, a fish. Exactly. Than a pet. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, exactly. Know, red, red devils and, like I said, we put the hand in the tank, pat them, you know, play with them, anything go anywhere near it and that thing wanted to rip its heart out. Like it was just mm. an attack dog in a, in a tank. But the owner comes near it and it's just calm and, and like that because it's, it's got that pet from we which you don't get from the smaller fish. Um, yeah, but exactly. Same, like, your big um, big plecos, unlikely that that can happen as well because it's not their nature to allow that as well. Yeah, but I mean, even, even I've seen a lot of people like... hand 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 feeding those sorts of things and, and and doing some sort of interaction with them. You know, like that's weird, bro. They're creepy. <laughs> yes, they are. 
but um, it's like easy, easier for them. It's, it it's easier to, um, you know, like name them and all this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and like even like from people. a distance having that bond, um, and like learn their behavior and everything like that. Um, yeah. it's more like visible than you know, like just a little tetra in the group of tetras, um, kind of just cruising around, not really doing anything that notable. Um, mm-hmm. I know the uh, tetra people will come after me, it'd, but you know, it'd be interesting to see what a um, what a 60 centimeter neon tetra will behave like, though. Mm. You know, um, arguably, think, if you sit in front of your tank for long enough and look at your tetras for long enough, you'd be able to pick them out. Probably not from a distance, but you would be able to pick out. Oh yeah, those fish if you're putting that same sort of time kind of fit into it. I agree. It's just harder, um, really. Um, yeah. Like and I know, guess anyone also... knows what Benny's up to, but you kind of have to look to see what the tetras are up to. Yeah. And I guess I guess the tetras um, seem to form a different place in the environment. You know, like mm-hmm. they are um, essentially. A part of the life cycle, they they end up being food, and um, so their mindset, I guess, is more um, on survival and schooling and and that sort of thing mm-hmm. than a big solo big fish, which is probably the king, and is cruising mm-hmm. around and his kind of his kind of brain works a bit differently, you know, because not many things can actually eat him, so so, <laughs> so he he has a bit so more personality. You that, and, and, would you think that? Many monster fish will be close to apex predators in the wild, or closer to the top. Well, definitely closer to the top. You see them when you see videos and stuff. They're definitely cruising around, like yeah. that. I'd say king. for. I mean, probably. I don't know if it applies to New Zealand monster fish, but like monster fish in general, sort of. I think exist kind of separate to it, and like a big, I don't know, what's an example? Like a red-tailed cat isn't really a predator, but it's not really prey. They kind of just are, like, so big, they just do whatever they want and, like, go around and pick up, you know, scavenge stuff and whatever, or, or, like, suck up little fish. But they're not, like, active hunters in the same way, like, I don't know, like a like a living stone I might be, um, if that yeah. makes sense. Because um, yeah. even like something like an arowana, I wouldn't say it's like an apex predator, because like it just spends its day like picking off little insects and stuff. Like mm. it's not going around hunting down fish and like um, sucking them back. It kind of just they have their little niche, and then obviously like you get um, you know jaguars and stuff eat them, but I mean I don't know about that, but they they're not so much like apex predators. It's like a whale. Mm. And, and they just, you know, filter feed out all the plankton. The arowana just pick off all the little insects and call it a day, really. Uh, but I guess, so, yeah. I guess, I'm, I guess, what I was trying to say is, like, you know, you put your hand in a fish tank and your neons will scatter. You know, oh but yeah, those, those bigger fish will just be like, what's going on? You know, and they'll come up and investigate think... because they 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 they've got a different sort of. <laughs> you know, they're a big boy and, and they, they know they're not, not gonna everything get, can eat them basically so, so they yeah, have they have the luxury safer. of being able to investigate yeah 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 that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's that's kind of maybe and maybe that leads into a little bit more of the personality and a bit more of the interactiveness because it's not worried that it's going to get eaten its whole life <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know, like, it can actually chill a little bit yeah exactly no that I definitely agree with that. I think that's a really that's, important sort of aspect my, to their natural behaviours. That's my scientific uh, analysis, analysis from ever having kept one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I think it's correct, so that's the main thing. Yeah, the, I uh, think that's the, the, cool. the thesis is to follow. <laughs> yep, sound, I look forward to it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we kind of touched on it a little bit before, um, but I think it's something that might be worth kind of diving more into is around more the place within more, I'm going to say more the industry rather than the hobby. Um, because I think in the hobby, there's definitely people that will keep them. Um, but in terms of the industry, like the way we approach them and like the way we treat them and all this kind of thing. Um, I'd be interested to hear your guys' thoughts on that space and if 
if uh, like what if anything you'd like to see change um, and all that sort of um, maybe some ideas you might have or whatever um, in that sort of space. I don't know which you want to kind of go first, but yeah, I think that's kind of quite an interesting point that I think the listeners might get a lot out of. It's interesting because um, from a from an industry point of view, and obviously with me not keeping these fish, I don't have a lot of exposure to it apart from from you guys, from what I've heard you guys say, or from obviously things I've seen in my travels and that. But from what I've seen and heard, they they do end up going to homes that aren't suitable, you know. And people would always tell me oh, my mate had this giant tank and he had all these fish in it and they get their hands and they can they can say how big the tank is, you know, with their hands. And I'm just like, well, <laughs> yeah, to, to you, that was a giant tank, but to that fish, it was probably not big enough, you know? Like, so that's about all, the, all that I've really seen, you know? I also think they come in too cheap and too, uh, too readily available, you know? I think It'll that's be- a major one. Yeah, like at Sushi Circus Silver Arowana, they're probably one of the harder ones to keep and they're one of the cheaper ones to buy. The easier ones yeah, to buy. Exactly. You, can go on, you can go online and order one and have it and you let it have you have it on your doorstep the next day. You know? And again, I don't know I, I haven't bought any of these fish or seen these fish be sold. So maybe the retailers are doing their due diligence, but I kind of doubt it. You know, but I have just to say it's so pessimist rather than optimist. With- <laughs> with um, obviously having a more like um, I know Cam's shop is more online and my shop's more in person focused um, but I've had a lot of people like a too many people coming in saying oh yeah like they see my marijuana I'm like oh yeah I've they've like oh yeah I've got an marijuana it's in a you know four foot tank at the most um, and he's about this big like the size of your hand um, and they're not not looking to upgrade or anything and that's the plan for its life um, so I'd say obviously we hope the re- other retailers are doing that kind of education but just in what I've experienced that's not happening um, or it's not sticking and, and they, could, they could be exactly. telling them and then people for whatever reason, the message isn't getting through. I think another part of the biggest part of the industry is if you're going to sell these fish, you need to also give people the opportunity or the ability to buy the right tank for them, right? Yeah, so like, exactly. You could probably go into, imagine any fish shop in the country and say, hey, I need a eight foot by three foot tank for my silver arowana. And, and most of them would struggle to, to source it. They'll probably have to go and get it custom made and cabinets and it would be it would be it would be a it would be a major, you know what I mean? In twelve mil glass yeah. and all the rest of it. Um so like yes, you can you can have the intention of doing the best thing for it. I mean maybe maybe that person would tick it up when they buy the fish when when they're in the zone, if they if it was available. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but then are you going to then are you going to sit on a you know four or five thousand dollar tank in your fish shop just in case someone buys a silver arowana? So it goes full circle, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's a, it is definitely a hard one, and I think it's hard with like the silver and black arowanas because they are so cheap. Um, I think in like with that when you start looking at like the Asian arowanas, I see a lot more getting kept in defensible size tanks because like number one obviously they don't get quite as big um but also if you're spending five thousand dollars on a fish you're more likely to be spending Mm. you know equal amounts on a big tank um but yeah i mean like in my opinion a silver arowana should be like a fifteen hundred dollar fish really at at the minimum um to kind of reflect the size and like it's basically a dog except slightly bigger, you know? Um, So, yeah, I mean, that is the the struggle, especially with the silver I want is um, what I've found. Um, And even something like as non-monster, I guess, as like like an Oscar, um, for example, uh, they, I think they are far too cheap. Like, um, I remember before I had the shop in that, 
being like, because I went to go buy an Oscar from someone, um, my big red Oscar I have at the shop. And I remember I like looked at it and it was like $60 or something. And I was like really, really surprised because um, I obviously had done all the research beforehand and like had a big tank sus and everything. And I was like, oh, yeah, it'll be, you know, I was expecting like $150 fish or something. And I like, walk in and it's like, oh, yeah, $60, you can grab it right now. And there was a tank of like 20 of them. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, obviously, that's good in in that perspective where – you know, everything's already set up. You've got a big tank. You've got the research. Obviously, you don't want to, you know, pay as much. Um, but it's one of those ones where the price probably should be high enough where it can deter the impulse purchase um, when the tank is not set up or, or environment is not set up. Um, mm. So, yeah, that, that, that that's kind of goes across the board, I think, um, for all the sort of more monster fish. Mm. I think what would... What would you guys say? I, I need just I've got something on the top of my tongue. Then you can talk, Cam. Sorry. Um, um, I'm just gonna say, what would you guys say to the? I know what you're gonna say, but it'll be interesting. Um, to the to the um, the theory, or was it a theory or the misconception that um, a fish only grows to the size of its environment and, and it's all good, you know? Just just tuck have, it in there, and let, let it get stunted, you know? I have something that I used to say to customers, but I had to stop because I think it was a bit much but like you can put a baby in a drawer and it's not going to get full size and <laughs> is that okay and then i i had to stop saying it because it's a bit much for people but it's like the same idea like obviously the baby's not going to get that big but it's not going to mm. have a happy life or anything um it's so they uh, deformed babies yeah. and stuff is probably something that inbreed can would be be used to you know like <laughs> sort of the environment he's south island in. things yeah, wellington yeah. man <laughs> for the pick on cam morning Gosh. but yeah i think mm. we, i think we need to, i think we need to kill that rumor that that thing that fish only go to the i mean uh, they do but only because they're actually being like mm, their metabolism their, their physical structure has been stunted you know like they've physically yeah. stopped growing because the they're in so much waste and crap and, and they ran out of room. They can't actually grow, but their eyes keep growing and their organs keep growing and, and it's just not a not a good environment for them, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, back to what you were asking before about the industry. I um, I think it's probably two things. I, I would be all for some sort of a licensing system, whether it's being at the retail side of it or whether it's being at the home fish keeping side of it. Um or at least some more involvement by the SPCA for scenarios like big fish, small tanks kind of thing. Um, so I think that's one one side of it. Um, you sort of do that and maybe some more of your not-so-specialized pet shops stop selling some of these big fish because they're needing to do more education on it. Or even some of the more specialized fish shops might remove themselves from that side of it thinking we don't need to be in there. Um, and from... From me as a personal side for the fish room, I made a very clear decision several years ago that I didn't want to be involved in uh, basically fish being neglected and, and not treated very well. So I don't sell anything that gets gets large for that reason. Um, I don't carry gold spot, red spot plecos. I think they're one of the more neglected fish around. Same with Oscars. Um, so I, I don't carry anything that gets larger than what most people could probably house properly. Um, and generally if people ask for them depending on the fish I'll, I'll say no for that reason I really want a really big tank cleaner for my two foot tank can I get a gold spot pleco that ain't happening sort of scenario so um, I think industry stakeholders like shops need to be more more onto it with the questions they ask and not put the money before the the care of the fish in many situations I think mm. I think the problem is like because I I very much like I so I do carry Oscars and stuff and like I carry common plecos and that, um, but I do I'd say obviously I don't have the numbers but I'd say for every one I sell, there's probably like fifteen I attempted sales I decline, um, yeah. and I mean for me that's what I want like I don't want to send you know essentially give this fish a death sentence. But 
the the challenge is like objectively speaking um from a business standpoint if we we're selling you know orange juice or something that's not that doesn't make sense um and i mean so i'm i'm fortunate in in that my business is going well enough where i can sort of turn down sales like that um but i'm sure there's many people where that sale is you know every sale is like life life and death but i think that's i i don't know what to what to make of that in that i do like i kind of i from the retailer side of things i understand even if i disagree um but yeah i mean it's it is a really challenging one um because i think it needs to come from outside of outside of like the retail end of things just because it's like mm-hmm. in terms of a of a commodity is acting outside the retailer's own interest to decline it um mm-hmm. it is more like an animal welfare um point of view which i think is obviously ideally every retailer would ensure every fish goes to the perfect home but i think that's an unreasonable expectation um in that is there bad actors or in, well i think it's um how do i explain it is an expectation that like i have i know i of myself i have very high expectations in that respect but to the solution to the problem can't be to expect that out of every well maybe expect isn't the right word but to every retailer we know isn't going to do that um so we can't leave the fish to kind of suffer for that i think there has to be some form of like regulation or something mm. from outside of that um to it. kind of hold re- hold retailers um put retailers in check and like accountable and all this kind of thing mm. and um, it's like it's it's reasonable to believe that retailers selling cats and dogs will be trying to put them in the best possible homes they're not um mm. you know going to be selling it are we allowed to get dog you know a big dog that's going to go into just a small tiny room for their entire life it's reasonable to expect that mm. from a retailer so why is it not reasonable mm. to expect that someone selling a fish that's going to get to a foot long is not saying no to people that can only provide them with a one foot tank and i think i think it's probably the wrong word it's more it's more like that is what we should expect and what mm. should happen but history or like um present state of you know these fish tells us that it doesn't happen like mm. no matter what we think there's still i could name you shops that still sell silver arowanas to two foot tanks so mm. that's not going to change and those and those so we shops got to do something else and those shops aren't small retailers or unknown shops you know uh, you yeah know. So it, it is you, it is shops that should know better to be honest so you, you're saying it's not going to change i'm sure 20 years ago the attitude by putting a having a small dog in a small area was not going to change but look at it now no, he didn't i don't think yeah, he said it wasn't going to change. he was i think i think the problem is we don't have we don't have, actually have a, any like a body in new zealand actually looking after aquatics as such the, I think the industry, one that's down a little bit one that down a little bit further and most people don't really give a shit about fish they don't care, <laughs> they don't <laughs> care fish. but imagine yeah, imagine yeah. if the spca put sent out and or the go i don't know who would actually regulate that would the spca regulate animal laws i don't know but there yeah. would be something for a silver arowana where there was now a process right and you went into a pet shop and you applied to have one okay and there was a wait list right and um yeah. Part of that wait list was you had to pay 200 bucks to the pet shop and they had to come out and look at you, your tank and your and, and, and assess you as based on a bunch of criteria that were already predetermined you know fish tank this size um knowledge of whatever else food and and da, 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 yeah. filtration all that sort of stuff they had to have a minimum amount of stuff you know and this person had to wait like a month or two to get their silver arowana to come in and get past these checks and then pay a lot of money for them you'd see a lot more going into good homes but there's also two... sorry karen oh no i was going to say there's two things i think that's important there is number one 
I don't know if the SPCA... Well, the SPCA doesn't really know what they're doing with fish, to be honest. Um, like, if you look through... They provide a care guide for axolotls, and it is, like, pretty comically shit. It's like, do exactly the opposite of what they say, and your axolotl will live. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, like, that is a concern. And then the other thing as well is... I understand, but I'm not sure that the pet shop, a pet shop can be the one to like do the inspection because you have a motivation to pass that person outside yeah. of objective reasoning is to make that sale. That person has to pass their tank inspection, obviously. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to like ideally, and like I'd like to think, and I know I would, do it like objectively like is this tank suitable or not but mm-hmm. i mean as it goes back to what i'm saying as history shows pet shops will kind of turn a blind eye or like um just pass anyway or whatever that tank so that you can make that sale because as we know a lot of pet shops struggle at the moment um to like make enough money so you're motivated you kind of almost need to make that sale in some cases i'm sure um, yeah, so. I think that's fair, but they can be structured in a way that they don't need to carry these fish to make those sales. Yeah, I agree. But and like, the, I guess I guess the hard part is that what is we don't need we're only really spitballing and any system can be um any system or process can be manipulated or whatever, you know. I was just thinking as a throwing it out there idea that the pet shop would be the easiest person to try and get this done with. You know what I mean? Because they would actually know something about fish and, and whatever. It was just, a, I agree. Just a, you know, yeah. I, I don't, oh, no, I don't know sure. what it would look like. I don't even know where it would come from, you know? Um, yeah. I think ideally it comes from outside the industry, but I think practically speaking, nothing is going to happen. Um, and I think it's up to maybe what I call kind of, new age retailers um, that seem to be sort of growing in market share at the moment to kind of make the change because, you know, it's been shown that no one else will. Um, so, yeah. I actually feel that it's probably saying that like the FNZAS should get behind um, or some other overarching governing body that's not really vested in it for any, any monetary gain mm. that should be and lobbying they- stuff. And again, the problem with the FNZAS is um, no one actually joins and it's, it's purely voluntary and it becomes one of those um, real selfless grinds to be on the committee of that and all that sort of stuff. Just to You just give, 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 give and it will take, 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 take. So yeah. as a voluntary sort of um, industry group, they probably are the best thing to walk towards an industry group. I mean, yeah. I'm not a member anymore. I don't know if you guys are anymore either, but um, I was. Yeah. Um, so it's easy for us to say the FNZAS should do it, but, um, but none I don't of even us are members or contributing to it. Yeah. In Auckland, I don't you even, know. there's not even anything to be a member of anymore. Um, if if the old old club shut down. Is it not there you anymore? Is the uh, Auckland nah. Fish Keeper Association not there anymore? Wow. Uh, kind of okay. sitting idle. I know um, Ray from Aquarius was the last president and he wanted to step down and then no one stepped up. Um, so it's kind of just sitting idle. Like um, I was a member, but then nothing like when, when he wanted to step down, everything just kind of stopped yeah. and nothing's happened in like two years. Um, so yeah. And that's, that's, what, that's slightly off that's topic. What I over is... The push on them is, on fish clubs is huge, but New Zealand fish clubs are just declining big time. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think pretty much it's just like Waikato and Christchurch that's alive, eh? Yeah, mm-hmm. and it just I comes know. down to it, it just comes down to one or two key people that just have the time uh, and the energy to go out there and smash it. I think in those clubs, uh, you know, Upper Hutt still running as well. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, and nice. and and Marlborough as well. From last I heard, but, yeah, not not a lot. I know Tasman's yeah. dropped out, and even. Even the clubs that are operating aren't massive. Even, like, probably, I think, from my understanding, Waikato's going to be the biggest. But 
you know, for the amount of people in Waikato, there's not that many members, um, mm. which does Any amount of people that um, keep fish. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, even so like semi-serious people. Industry stakeholder being the SPCA having to deal with it, or the Pet Association of New Zealand. I don't even know what that is, to be honest. Yeah, so well, I could um, work it out, but there's a New Zealand Pet Association. Um, only reason I know about it is because on all of the invoices from Tongs, I believe they say we're a member of the New Zealand Pet Association. Oh yeah, I did see that. I did uh, try yeah. to look it up, and yeah. I couldn't find anything, and I thought it was just so, old. You know, I don't know if that's more retailing side of it as opposed to animal welfare, but there's another potential stakeholder that could be contributing to improving the, the lives of, of aquatic animals. I think it goes back to something I want to do a part a podcast on in the future is the aquatic industry in New Zealand is very much um, still in the 80s, I think. It's very um, backyard. And that's something I know both of us and many other people are trying to improve, but it just takes time, man. Um, and I think, no, I nothing think also comes fast. we have to be very, very careful as an August, as an industry or as a, a hobby that we don't go too far too. You know, like yeah. if we get people like Peter and stuff involved, you know, like they, they believe that fish shouldn't be in tanks at all, you know. So we don't want to completely kill our industry. Mm. We yeah. just want to make it better. You know what I mean? We want to grow it. We want to make it better. We want it to be more successful for the people and the fish rather than... There's just some it, common you know? sense stuff, I think, that, you know, be really most reasonable change. people yeah. could get behind. Um, like, you know, you surveyed hobbyists, I'd say, like, at least 80% would be in favour of, you know, some of the stuff we've talked about. So, why like if not, someone basically? imported, if someone imported a thousand um, Dobermans, yeah, and then and then started selling them off for fifty bucks each on Trade Me, some people would have something to, to know about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, hey, New Zealand can't support a thousand Dobermans for fifty dollars each. They're going to go for a poach, you know. You know, so it's a similar sort of thing for the silver arowanas, I believe. You know, they just too cheap, too many. Mm. But, yeah. yeah. So does I that mean go back to the, to the importers and the wholesalers making this issue? Should they be bringing in the amount they bring in? But they're driven by money as well. I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to that same thing. Fish is just stock on the shelf, mate. That's all they are yeah. to a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. And, yeah. and at the end of the day, they do need to make money to feed their family and pay their staff and, and, and get keep their facilities going. So it always a hard ethical versus money, financial the money decision. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's, um, it is, I guess um, it's... Karen? It is, it is more sort of a... It, it, it kind of goes around as like everyone in the industry kind of has the same thing of industry, like business side like it doesn't make sense to stop selling stuff if it sells but then that's outside of you know ethical um constraints and everything about it's not just like a you know box of orange juice that you're selling it's something that's actually alive um mm. and needs there's more that goes into it instead of like uh you come to me want to buy it i sell you it and then i buy more um it yep. is kind of a bit of a that is the challenge um because i mean like if i like if i sold any fish to anyone who came in i could sell so many more fish but that all last about a week and you know that's not what i want to do um or not what i'm here for but Unfortunately, some people don't have that luxury of being able to decline sales because, you know, they've got bills to pay, got kids to feed, got, you know, life to live, I, uh, I, I, which I makes still it argue a challenge. That you can restructure a business, a fish business, to not be having to decline, but just not doing, not carrying it to start with. I, I, the, I agree, but it is one of those ones where it's like, it's a, it's a lot of effort, like to kind of pivot, I guess, because um, like I, it makes like big fish would make up such a minuscule percentage of what I do, but it is effort 
um, a lot of effort and a lot of work to like educate everyone who comes in looking for an Oscar that, you know, you're not going to be suiting, suiting an Oscar um, with. So it's I mean, easy just I, not to carry them is my point and give other, other options. Yeah. But I mean, you still got to educate those people though. Like if someone comes in looking for an Oscar, I mean, and the, the, they come the in and it's like, they got to go somewhere else anyway and buy it. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. And, and that's the problem with the industry is um, you guys can do all you want. Cam, down there inbreeding and stuff, he can do what he wants with them. Um, but uh, but they're probably going to the local chain store and just go, hey, can you get me an Oscar in? And then they'll just so, order it off the list. You know what I mean? So, so then, but, then my rollback question is, if, someone, if you're going to put this in and decline someone and someone's going to buy it anyway... Why are we we worried if someone's just going to neglect the fish anyway? Why why are you declining the sale? Is it your own ethical my, thing? My thing is like, because I know we've discussed it before and have different opinions. My thing is like, just about control is like, so all the fish I currently have in stock at the shop, they're all my responsibility and like, I'm responsible for their welfare. So... If I'm not confident that it's going to go to a suitable tank, I will de decline the sale or like try sell them something that would be suitable. But the problem is then they go somewhere else. But I can't control that. I can only, you know, educate and control the fish that I have. And then that's as much as I can do. And if they're going to go elsewhere and source them, that sucks. And I'll try teach them why not. But at the end of the day, that is not something I can control. Like, I can't stop them. Um, and I'd like to hope that wherever they go is going to say the same thing of, oh, you need a bigger tank or whatever. But I can't, you know, no, that's not something I can do. Like, that's why I think, you know, even with the podcast is like trying to further their education. Um, and then in the business side of things, just being responsible for what I can be responsible for, which is the the specific fish, not just the species of fish, um, like the specific individuals. So, yeah, that, that's kind of my thoughts on it. And, and the cool thing about what you do is may, maybe two out of ten or three out of ten of those people might actually learn from it and gain value from it. You yeah. know what I mean? At least someone is telling them something that, you know. Uh, that yeah, might be I think education across correct, the board is so important. You know? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, it's so important. It's something I put a lot of effort into. Um, if I like, I, I like to think I'm making a difference, but honestly, like, you know, I have no idea. Um, mm -hmm. there's no way I can measure that, but it is, it goes back to it's, it's what I can do. Um, mm -hmm. like I can't expect to one, like just wake up one morning and stop every bad sale. Um, that's not a reasonable expectation, but I can do my best. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and over time, hopefully it makes a difference um, and maybe will stop all the bad sales, but, you know, see where we end up, I suppose. Also, I, I guess it's your opinion on what a good yeah, and exactly. a bad sale is too. But So that, that I think we have to be really careful um, so people listening to us don't think we're arrogant and we know everything and, 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 and everyone shall do as we say. Um, exactly. It's, it's your opinion based on your experience and what the optimum home is for that fish, you know. And um, us three would probably all disagree on that anyway for a lot of fish, you know. Yeah. We would have some, yeah, exactly. some benchmarks we'd probably agree on, but um, and we'd probably also go more on the side of bigger and more ambitious than, you know, what is the minimum? You know, I mean, we're taking these things out of giant lakes and millions and billions of litres of water and stuff, and then we stick them in little glass bowls, little glass tanks for our enjoyment. Mm. You know, yeah, exactly. The, the, the minimum <laughs> argument will go around in circles for as long as we're keeping fish, yeah. you know. I, I think the key you use there is it's opinion-based. This whole industry is opinion-based. Well, more opinion-based and factual-based and more opinion-based than governance-based and more opinion-based than... Uh, guideline based and I think that's where there's a massive issue in the particular industry for selling bigger fish old mate had an Oscar and an AR 980 and lived for five years sweet as good times and that Oscar should have lasted three times that size that length of time and it should have been in a in a five foot tank sort of thing 
But mm. it went yeah. fine for five years, so my opinion is that it's fine to go in that tank for that long. And because things yep. change over time as well is the important thing. Like I mentioned the SPCA um, axolotl thing, like care thing, um, and that was the best of our knowledge. That was how you should care for an axolotl, like, I don't know, whenever they made it, ages ago. Um, but that hasn't been updated because it's all sort of subjective. But then, you know, that leads to axolotls not having the greatest care now, according to what we know. So, like, how far should things change? Um, you know, well, because oftentimes I'm sure there's things that changes, but too fast or, or opinions change too fast. And it's like, actually, that's probably not the best thing. Um, so it's kind of like adjusting for the, being mindful that what we think now isn't, the absolute truth. It is just our best understandings according to what we know about the fish and about the world we live in, um, mm. which, you know, won't be the same next week, let alone next year. Um, I guess we should probably also try and get back into monster fish because we've kind of yeah. gone into the industry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Do, do we each fun. have, do we each have like, I guess maybe a quick and dirty sort of, you know, what, what are we, um, what are we looking for? For a monster fish like um we'll just say cam someone comes into you and says hey i want to have and a big fish tank with big south americans i want to get some oscars i want to get some texas and whatever else you know well, how big should my tank be i want the i want to put the perfect tank in place for this fish and budget isn't isn't an issue you know what, a, what say, do they need you know i'd say bare minimum you'd want a six foot tank bare minimum, but ideally more if you're going to be putting a whole bunch of different stuff in. Um, so maybe, I don't know, we'll, we'll take, a, you can have a community with, say, Baishas, Plecos, actually, no, you can't, but, like, say, Baishas, Datnoids, Oscars. Um, maybe some sieves, chuck some sieverums in there or something. Yeah, sieverums, silver dollars, all that kind of thing. You can, I'd say you can pretty comfortably do that in a six foot tank, but you'd want a bit more um, space and you just want to make sure, you know, it, it's, it's actually very similar to like a small tank. It's just like the scale is bigger. You need bigger water changes. You need a bigger filter. You need a bigger tank, bigger light, bigger fish, more food. Um, but yeah, I mean, the same principles apply of like maintaining water parameters um, feeding the right food, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's most of them aren't too difficult. It's just more time consuming and more expensive and everything like that. Would you say like a single Oscar and a, like a a four foot by two foot by two foot tank would be like a, as a pet as a as a single owner fish? Is that is that ethical? I mean, do, they, do they have I, a good a, I mean, good health a good a good time on their own if they're interacting with? That's an owner, one of those. Or? That's one of those ones where it's like so a four by two by two. Or, which is like 120 centimeters by 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters is I'm going to say that's a defensible position. Like I can understand why you'd say that, but in my experience of keeping Oscars, like I have a lot of Oscars right now and I love them. I'm going to say five foot would be the minimum um, really that you want to keep them in. Um, ideally bigger, obviously, but I, I personally wouldn't keep them in, in a four foot tank, but I can understand the argument and that's fine. I'm going to say not like I, I get not it. Recommended, you, not recommended. Not recommended. I'm not going to probably if for a four, four by two by two, I'm not going to stop someone. Like I'm probably going to sell to that tank because it's, I can understand why you'd come to that conclusion. Um, hmm. So I'd say like, Probably's you know, you can have an Oscar in there and like you can yeah, maybe try Sorry, what's what, that? Sorry? You're, you're at the cool. bottom end of acceptable when it comes to just having an individual yeah. wet pet in four by two. Yeah, you know, it's and, a bit small for me, good. but I get it. Great, but four by two, you can you can make work okay, and you might yeah. look at it. Well, I can upgrade later on, sort of thing. But four by two is kind of where you you don't want to go too. Yeah, much. you're fine. You're you're fine. I I I I deem that acceptable, but um, I wouldn't basically um, with that kind of thing. Um, and it's probably it's probably going to a better home than. Then, then a lot of them aren't. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, exactly. 
and yeah, it's not going to happen. Mean, it's can't... not going to have a terrible life. Yeah, I mean, we can't anyone pretend that we have the absolute truth. Um, it is all subjective, and that's one of those ones where objectively it's close enough, but subjectively you can disagree. But I can't say, like, the same way I could, and arowana goes in that tank, I can't say for sure that fish is going to have a terrible life. Um which is, I mm. think, ba- the basic basic point. Mm. Mm. Okay. So and what you, yeah. we talked about we talked about Oscars. I think um, we said some other. I mean, my thing, but I, I would regard Frontosa as um, as a um, monster fish too, and I would say minimum Me one point eight meters, one point eight minimum one point eight meters for those two. Um, what about some of the more common stuff that you buy small, like like a silver shark or a tinfoil barb or something like that? You know. Are we still in the five to six foot range for those? You reckon when they get a bit bigger, or I'm in the six to eight foot range. Yeah, six to eight the, foot. the the problem with them is because they swim, they're too active. Oh. Like you know, them and bar, mm. barla sharks and stuff is like they're not as active as an Oscar, so they're going to need more room. Um, and also, the other problem with them is they are they freak out and just smash themselves into the glass. So you want to have enough room where they can, you know, if they startle each other. They don't. They have enough room to kind of have their little zip without smashing straight into something and dying. But you can buy a um, a seven centimeter silver shark really cheap at most shops. Okay, that we don't want to go back fish. into the industry. We don't want to go into the industry that's, anyway. <laughs> that's one fish that I I don't think anyone should keep that fish. It's so boring and so crazy, and I think is, cool. it's a stupid fish. I think they're cool. I think they're all I cool. Think, I think they're quite cool. But I mean, in the right environment, I think. Yeah. If you could have 10 of them in a big tank, that would be impressive. That would be real cool. Schooling mm-hmm. around, swimming at each other. Agree you know, to disagree. Doing fishy stuff. Doing yeah. Fishy stuff. Do, you have, do you have anything to add, Cam, on, on what you probably don't see a lot down there because I mean, people just uh, – electricity is a really new thing, you know, that sort of stuff. <laughs> So, you know, what, what else? What, do you see anything down there? Much down there in Monster Fish? <laughs> yeah, all um, uh, there used to be a lot more big fish going into small tanks, but that's uh, a couple of the retailers will change hands and that stops a lot more now. Um, I, I agree with Cam. I think the best best case scenario, most bigger fish should be starting in in a, a six by two by two. I think that's a really good tank shape. But I also totally understand people can't get six foot tanks in a lot of spaces. Um, but that's where smaller fish become a, a better option if you can't if you can't house it properly. Um, yeah, I, I, silver sharks has just sort of triggered me a little bit because. I get asked for silver sharks on a regular basis because old mate down the road sells them, sells them as individuals, doesn't tell people they get ginormous and they're ridiculously fast and they're going to smash themselves on the glass and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's another interesting one as well. Hmm. So. I had I had, I had silver sharks in a three-foot tank when I was when I started out. Yeah. <laughs> so and, 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 I, and I thought they were cool. So, you know, yeah. like, uh, and that's you know, I realised them. People have got to start somewhere. People have got to make mistakes along the way to learn as well. But it's when yeah. people make mistakes and don't learn, that's where the where the problem is, I suppose. Yeah, man. Yeah. I think there is one other thing I think is important to note about these sort of things is like a little arowana or like a little um, jag or you know silver shark or whatever is they're like they're pretty boring fish like most of these monster fish don't sort of come into their own until they get big. Like a little one is like a little arowana is just the same in terms of like what's going on as like a hatchet fish or like a, a um, what's that thing called? Butterfly, African butterfly mm. fish or something. Like mm. there's no point getting a fish that's going to get too big that you can't let get that big just because quite frankly, there's no point. They are the most boring things in the whole world. Um, like a silver arowana objectively doesn't isn't colourful and doesn't behave that interesting really till it gets big. So like 
So you put yeah. them in the same it's category. It's kind of the worst of. When they're little, yes, they're more calm. Like they won't zip around as much, but they're equally as boring. Um, you kind and, of get the most, worst of both worlds. Most people probably buy them because they get big. They don't buy them yeah, because exactly. they're cool and they're little. You know what I mean? It's not like it's not like a trophy as the Boise that you don't want to grow up. You know what I mean? Because it yeah, stays exactly. cool when it's little. You know, like they they buy them little because they want them to get big. You know, they, they've yeah, exactly. seen them somewhere or whatever. You know. But you have to let them get big, otherwise it's the most boring thing in the world, and you'll hate it mm. essentially. Um, yeah, so, so you never actually just... going, what, you're, what you're saying is, if you buy it and you don't have the tank for it, you're never going to get to actually enjoy it anyway. So you're yeah, exactly. It's not, like a it's a lose it. lose situation. <laughs> like there's plenty of options. Like for every monster fish, there's a small size or small to medium size counterpart that will be you'll get just as much, if not more, out of. But Will be happy and everything. Could yep. could we so, see yeah. people buying silver arowana much like they buy a puppy because they want to get that connectivity and that bond with them all the way growing up, like you would a puppy to a dog? Oh no, hundred percent. Like if I was going to buy a silver arowana, I'd buy a little one, hundred percent. But that's with the understanding that it'll get big, and that's when like, you get the most out of it. But I wouldn't buy one just because it's like, you know, just for when it's little without the understanding of you'll get a lot out of it when it's big. Um, yeah. Just because, no, like, no hate, but it's like get a rock, you'll get the same amount of enjoyment out of it. It's kind of boring. So, yeah. It's like, um, it's like you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna buy a fish and you think that you're going to enjoy it when it gets big, but you don't have the ability to get it big. So you spend 200 bucks on it and then you spend all this time and money feeding it and then – you realise when it gets big, you can't actually. No one can actually house it, and it's not worth anything. So you end up giving it away, probably to another potentially not great home either. And it's just like it's just a shit sandwich, isn't it? Really, you just don't even really get to enjoy yeah, exactly. it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know? that is the challenge with them um, for sure. So yeah. Okay. Do we have any more you want to say on monster fish? Plenty more. Plenty more. I don't. I, I think we. But not we for spent today. Most of the time, most of the time, bitching about the industry, which um, which was another subject. So I don't know. We're gonna have to. I think really, it's something uh, that would be that. interesting for people. I think um, it is relevant we, to monster think, fish too, particularly. Yeah, and I think we have unique perspectives on that um, compared to, you know, a hobbyist-based podcast in that. That's not you know these other people's expertise so like i think it, it's something we can off like obviously let us know listeners if it's if i'm wrong and you don't care or you want to hear more either way let us know but i think that's that's an interesting point of view that probably doesn't get shared as much um for some other reasons that we'll talk about in the industry podcast cool yeah all right so we're done we're good yep all right. yeah thanks for joining I'm happy. thanks for joining us Thanks for joining us, the three idiots, today on our podcast, uh, talking about Monster Fish. Um, we've got Cam Inbred and the Cooler Cam and Ryan Ruffin <laughs> here signing off. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about live bearers, so another a gr- another great subject for me. I love my <laughs> live bearers and plants and Monster Fish and, oh, you know, plecos that hide all day. It's going to be spectacular. Looking forward to seeing you all. Make sure you like and subscribe and uh, talk to Cam about the merch. See you.